Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode number 13. I'm your host, Derek Moore, and today we'll be talking about the art of selling volatility and really all things volatility. And with us today to help us is the Tony Randall of the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, Jay Pestricelli, the founder of Zega Financial and author of Buy and Hedge. How's it going, Jay? Good, Derek. Thanks for having me on. I uh, I don't know if it's Lucky 13 or what, but um, I it's great. Number 13. I'm happy to be back. Yeah. And by the way, for those of you who, who have no idea why the Tony Randall reference got in there, uh, we were trying to figure that out, the odd couple. And he appeared on Letterman 75 times as a guest. And sometimes he would do a cameo. And so you, you've, you've appeared more than anyone else as a guest. So that's why we want that. Okay. Uh, it is my honor, Derek. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here again. And so, you know, the, the last couple episodes I've done are, are, I would say, very good. What we've been focusing on interest rates and the present value of future earnings and just the so it, it would be good to get back to the sort of nitty gritty of the the trading side of things and really volatility and of course one of the strategies that we use is the Sega Financial the short volatility strategy for the right percentage of an account and but we always get questions Jay I know you get them all the time what do you mean by volatility what is this VIX and so we're going to go through a number of things that will get a little bit wonky on this, but we get questions all the time. So I'll just throw it to you, Jay. I mean, the, the VIX index, what is it? Why should people care? And, and how is it constructed? Yeah. Uh, okay, Derek, happy to take on the, the the wonky question, as you point out. Yeah, the VIX is, if, if, uh, if you had to define the stock market as a reflection of fear and greed, as most people do, the VIX is the way to quantify that data. Uh, the VIX is often referred to as the fear index, but I prefer to consider it more of the market's appetite for speculating. Seems like a weird way to def to deflect there, but typically what that means is um, the VIX is a representative of how much people are willing to pay for large movements in the options market. There's actually no index. Uh, holdings in the VIX. It's a calculation. It's math based off of how volatile the options look in the S&P 500. And so the more volatile, the more people are willing to pay up for calls and puts in the S&P 500 option market, uh, the more the VIX will move. It is really a calculation. You can't actually buy the VIX. Now, you could buy futures that are based on the VIX and options that are based on the VIX, but owning the VIX itself is impossible because it is simply an equation. Um, as I touched on a second ago, uh, the equation, while it's you know a whole bunch of statistical measurements, essentially looks at a projection of what the next 30 days movement are implied. Meaning, when you look at the options based on how much people are willing to pay for options uh, on the S&P 500 over the next 30 days, that gives you an indication of how much movement is expected in the stock market. So believe it or not, the VIX using options on the S&P 500 is a reflection of where option traders project the market will go in the next 30 days. So woof, it is a it is a forward-looking vehicle and I think Derek you'll get into how that uh, can be such a such a such to be the case, but when we consider the VIX, we look at it as what is the state of being of fear and greed in the marketplace and how much appetite is there for speculative and large moves over the next 30 days. So I'll pause there for a second, Derek. I hope that wasn't too wonky using that word for the last time, I hope, today. But uh, it's just designed to give you an understanding of how much market volatility do we expect to see, meaning ups and downs, over the next month. Yeah, I think an important point, too, and you mentioned this, you started going to it, is the idea that you can't trade the VIX. The VIX is called, it's referred to as the cash index, and it's just an index. It's not tradable. And, and maybe I'll explain more on, on why that is. People who buy options or VIX options, they are actually buying options on the movement of the VIX future. And so the VIX future, those are actually issued monthly and now they're issued really weekly up, up in the front months. And so one of the challenges for people who are trying to make, uh, I'll just call it bets or positions on the VIX going higher or lower, is they've got to buy a vehicle that's going to expire in, in a number of days. Uh, and so typically, if volatility is low, the value of that starts to drain quickly. But 
a lot of people are, you know, buy VIX option. And by the way, I mean, you and I used to be at Ameritrade, TD Ameritrade, of course, right? And people trade VIX options and it always was a little confusing. What are they trading options on? It's not the VIX index, it's the VIX future. And so I think that's that's an important point. And, and the other thing, you know, there there's volatility now on a number of different things. I know at, at Zega, uh, when you're running the strategy and, and you and your traders are looking at things, sometimes you can optimize where you're selling volatility. And we'll talk about that later. But there is volatility on the NASDAQ, the Russell, and also the S&P. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, sure. Hey, if there's an options market, you can create a VIX for it. Because once again, it's just a calculation. It's just math. And so when we look at indexes like the NASDAQ 100 or the Russell 2000, as well as the S&P 500, um, uh, the, these, uh, indexes have options on them. And so we can, you know, take a look at the, uh, appetite for speculation within those option chains to see if people are paying more or less. Now, the strategy that I think we're probably going to get into in a moment, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump ahead and then we could pull back to it is, you know, we take advantage of, uh, the fact that there is speculation in the market with our high probability option strategy. You referred to it a moment ago as our short volatility strategy, um, but it is really uh, a strategy that we are sellers of volatility. It means we are selling to speculators many times. And you know if their speculation, uh, if they're willing to pay more, then that's great for us. And we actually take a look at of the different indexes. And we end up, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into the determination of that strategy, but we like to have an understanding of uh, if we're sellers of volatility, when is it expensive and when is it cheap? And as a seller, you want to sell things that are more expensive, right? You sell high, buy low kind of a situation. So when volatility is a little higher, we'll do that. And we use those indexes as a guideline to help us determine uh, which index to sell and which index to buy the volatility on. And that's that's a little bit of a, a, you know, when you're buying and selling, I'll say fear and greed, it's a different asset class. It really is. It, it is treated very differently, um, and hence its performance is very differently. But you're, back to your point, Derek, all of those indexes, because they have options and option chains on them, you can run a calculation to figure out exactly what the VIX would be on the NASDAQ 100. Uh, the actual, there's a symbol for that. You could type it in, it's VXN. Or if you want to know the volatility of the Russell 2000, it's RVX. They have their own symbols, just like VIX for the VIX. Yeah, and I think it's from a historical point of view too, you know, people always say, what's, what's high volatility, what's low volatility? 2017, 2016, 2017, but 2017 in particular, Jay, we saw the VIX remain under 10 for quite a long time in different stretches. And now more recently, it's back around you know, 18, 20 as it's sort of, I'll call it its, its constant state. That's probably a bad phrase, but uh, but the VIX certainly, you know, people ask, well, what's, what's a good VIX? What's a low VIX? It, typically, obviously it spikes when there's more fear, when people are willing to pay more for insurance. And it's very low typically, and I say typically, but you know, generally when it, when the market's uh, kind of in that uh, non-worry mode, right? But 2017 was fairly historical in how low the VIX was. In fact, a lot of people said, hey, it's broke. And now, of course, we're seeing higher levels. But Jay, I mean, isn't it true that when we look at options, uh, the volatility on the call side, I mean, people aren't generally short the market thinking, oh, I got to buy disaster protection of S&P 4000 when it's 29. There's sort of this embedded uh, risk premium that's on the put side, right? Well, yeah. I mean, there's always going to be people are always going to buy protection. It's not everybody, but there's there are always people that are speculating, speculating or protecting using long puts, right? Puts go up in value as the market drops. Uh, that will always exist, um, and there's actually always a premium because of that for whatever reason. We could go into that if we want to, if you want to talk about, you know, the impact of dividends and, and just the general speculation. But you are right about 2017. I just, I'm going to give you a little point. Um, since they really started tracking the VIX back to 1990, uh, uh, all of the 
days combined or the VIX close bet- below 10 don't add up to more than the number of days we had in 2017. So from 1990 to, 2017, to 2016, all of the days where the VIX closed below 10, that number doesn't exceed the number of days we saw a close below 10 in the year 2017. That's, that's quite staggering, actually, Jay. Yeah, it was, it was amazingly low, uh, which means as a volatility seller, which is the strategy, it's very hard to be profitable in a situation where the asset you're selling is already lower, right? You're trying to sell high, buy low. We are selling while we're at historical lows. Now, listen, it worked out for us because this strategy isn't really a pure short VIX play, but uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's very difficult uh, to be an option seller in those years. You should be an option buyer in those years. And by the way, we were for different strategies, right? We've talked about those as well, especially things like uh, buy and hedge and our ZBIG strategies. But I will, I will just hit on one last piece here against uh, uh, historical averages versus where we are today, high or low. Um, we are, you know, historically speaking, uh, in 2018, um, really kind of close to the averages, maybe slightly below when you look at the history of the VIX. So, uh, you know, for somebody to say, is it high or low? I think it's all relatively speaking. Um, fear and greed are difficult to quantify, and this is really the only way to do it. Uh, it's fair to say that uh, fear has fear and greed have gone back to equilibrium compared to a 2017 where fear was underrepresented in the options market. Yeah, I, th- I think that's well said. And you know, pe- people look at the options market sometimes as a predictor of future moves, and and the options market doesn't necessarily predict bull or bear, although there are, there are some more complicated things when it does that. But Jay, you know, when we think about implied volatility, and I guess that this is on the, uh, I'm, I'm taking this one, right? So I'll, I'll kind of start and, and let you come in later. But implied volatility is, and you know, okay. So what is implied volatility? What is historical volatility? Historical volatility looks at a market, let's say it's any stock or market, and it says how volatile has the price movement been? In other words, where has price been? How much does it move around? Implied volatility is looking forward. And I think, Jay, you mentioned the VIX is a forward-looking instrument. Implied volatility just simply says, hey, if we're looking at a market or looking at a stock, what is the options market predicting as far as the likelihood of a range? And a range means it could be really wide or it could be you know, really, really small. And when I think about implied volatility, and here we go again, Jay, with the analogies, but I I think about uh, if you if you look at a day, let's say in, uh, you know, an 80 degree day in Arizona where I live and there's no humidity and there's no wind. 80 degrees feels like 80 degrees. But if you're if you have an 80 degree day in in Florida and you've got 100 percent humidity, well, now it feels like 100 and I bring that up because one stock might have a price of 50, another stock might have a price of 50. One may have the, the volatility that's really low, but one may have implied volatility that's really high. And what happens is options premiums, they are priced high because the expectation of a move is greater than relative to another. And that's why you see a stock like Netflix right before earnings, their implied volatility is something like, you know, 300%, which is an annual number, and then you've got to bring that back down. But the quick way of doing this, Jay, is, of course, if you have an implied volatility of, let's say, 32 on a, on a market, and if you want to know what a one standard deviation move is, you take the 32 divided by, you know, call it 16, and roughly the options market is saying, hey, you know, 68% of the time, we're going to have a 2% range. So that's, that's kind of how implied volatility is just if, if something is perceived, to, and this is why, you know, a lot of beginning options traders, they try and buy options around earnings, but the expected moves are priced in a lot. And so implied volatility is, is really the market saying, we think this is going to be a greater range than this, and we're going to price it accordingly. How'd I do, Jay? You know what? Uh, I think you are extremely accurate. Uh, I am going to use a different analogy real quick I like it. for you, uh, and you, you beat it up as you will. Um, you know, the thing that drives implied volatility is prices, right? 
and uh, the pricing of an option uh, will go up and down, and volatility is one of those components. And that implied volatility, as the name says, means it's implied, meaning you can derive from the fact that if somebody's willing to pay twice as much for an option today uh, than they did yesterday, they are implying that they expect a larger move. So if you, you know, paid a dollar for, uh, you know, a Procter & Gamble, uh, a PG option, right? That tells you one thing, but that same option around the same strike prices might be something like, you know, $2 or $3 if you're picking a biotech firm uh, as, a, as, a, as a proxy. And you may say, well, listen, they're trading around the same price. Why would I pay twice as much for a bullish call option or a bearish put option? And the answer is because the likelihood that the stock will move is greater with that more with that more volatile stock, right? So the chance that options really are always based on this 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 maybe an over oversimplification, but they tell us the chance that they're going to go in the money. That's the whole thing that the price is based on. What is the chance that this option is worth something at expiration? And if you have to pay up twice as much for a very similar option, well, that tells you that the, it implies that the stock has a lot more volatility up and down, meaning your chances are greater that it'll go in the money. So if you paid a dollar versus paying two, all other things being equal, you can imply that the one that cost you $2 is on a stock that is got a, uh, more volatility in its daily prices. Not sure if that was a real analogy, but maybe it's just another way to kind of connect the dots about what the word implies means, because implies is a future looking uh, type uh, uh, description versus, like you said, historical volatility. No, I think that's right, Jay. And I, I think another way to look at that too is let's say that someone is trading with you and, and you're the other side of the trade. It's like, what would you price the premium at to sort of make it an, a, more of an even, uh, I don't want to call it a bet, but an even sort of play, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, right now, if, if you were to say, well, you know, uh, I think the stock is going to move a dollar and the options market is uh, is implying that with the the premium on the on the you know the, the call option or the put option, basically that's saying that if it moves more, somebody on the other side will make make money, and if it moves less, then they'll lose money. But it's really, I like the way you describe it in prices, and and I think it's it's worth you know you mentioned twenty seventeen, if you were buying options on let's say the S and P five hundred in twenty seventeen, those would be materially lower in cost. Than they would have been in December of 2008 or March of 2009 when the market was just moving everywhere every day. So, yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to pricing. But a lot of times I think the options market's trying to figure out how do we have a price that would make it fair to take a position on one side or the other? It makes it more of a, an even uh, thing, right? How do I do there? Yeah, no, no, you're right. And actually, I think that leads into why puts are typically a little more expensive than calls in the options market. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know we hadn't planned on hitting on that, but I'll take it real quick and just just throw this out to you, you know, Derek. Um, you know, wh why do you think puts cost more, typically speaking, in the options market than calls do? Yeah, and it's really from, you know, the folklore says since 1987, prior to 1987, 87, of course, was the, the big, uh, the crash in October of 07, 87. But options used to be priced a little more even, calls and puts. And so most of the world is long the market, meaning they own the market. And so most of the world is buying protection below the market. You know, people aren't buying protection above the market. They're doing other things like selling premium above the market. But if, if you look at it this way, in there is a small probability of outsized moves but to protect oneself and big institutions do this and banks, they are willing to pay for much further out of the money. I'll call it disaster protection. And because of that, there's this, this implied sort of bid in, in those options. And the, the other, going back to the other thing I was saying, if you're willing to, if somebody's buying that, someone's selling that, and there has to be a premium to the person to compensate them for selling that option, right? And so 
I, I just think, Jay, it's it's more about how most portfolios are structured. It's just you know, nobody's worried about crashing up. Yeah, it's 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 why there's it's why the, there's always a little bit of a, there's always put volume because there's a natural uh, uh, requirement for a lot of strategies and portfolios to have protection. And if you're the person on the other side or the entity on the other side of that protection trade, you're taking all the risk, and so you're going to charge a little more for taking that risk. Um, I, we, you and I have always said, Derek, right? Markets climb upstairs and fall out windows. And so slow upward progression of markets um, uh, is one of those things that, you know, it's why I call, in my opinion, another reason why calls aren't nearly as uh, 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 expensive because markets gapping up 10% in a day, that just doesn't happen. But markets gapping down 10% in a day or even just a week, that happens on a regular basis. Well, um, so if you have to buy protection, right, you're going to charge uh, you're sorry. You're willing to pay more for the thing that can happen dramatically in in a in a week uh, versus something that hey, over time this thing's just going to go. You know, markets are designed to go up. All those great things, but still, you want to provide protection. And the guy on the other side that's insuring it doesn't want to be unfairly compensated for the risks they take because markets move down very very quickly. You know, if, if, and that's the fear trade, right? Fear trade. We sometimes internally always talk about the panic day. Those those positions um, and puts appreciate very, very quickly, the more and more fearful the market gets. Um, and so the person that actually sold the puts wants to make sure they're compensated hyster- uh, historically over time, not hysterically, <laughs> historically uh, over time for the risk that they're taking. And listen, those 10% drops in a week don't happen often, but often enough that when those happened, you have to pay up for the insurance you sold. So they charge a little higher premium because of the uh, fast-moving down markets versus the fast-moving up markets. Yeah, I think you you mentioned, too, most of the the largest percent gains on single gains updates, right, were clustered around after you had really large drawdowns. I think you had that in your book, Buy and Hedge. And, you know, I I was trying to – I was explaining, I was doing a talk one day, and somebody said, what would cause the market to gap up 10%? And without even thinking about it too much, I said, I don't know, maybe – China and, and uh, Japan and, and Europe, all who are owning treasury bonds, just says, you know what, we'll just give those back to you. You don't have to pay us. I mean, I don't well, like what you think about, like, what would have to happen for a 15 percent update gap? It, it would be just out of the blue. Right. Not after we've gone down. It's I, I mean, I, I don't think it's ever happened. Right. So to, to speculate what would cause it would be would certainly be interesting um, when, you know, to, you know, if you actually look at say now, an individual stock can gap up fifteen oh, yeah. percent, and usually, what's that? What what drives that? Well, they said something completely unexpected, and everybody found that wow, the value of this company is much greater than we ever expected, so they buy it up. Uh, I guess if every company's earnings came out on the same day, and everybody said, "Hey, sorry, profits are going to be up twenty percent more than expected than last year," I mean, it would take something like that. Or it turns out every American uh, built their uh, has their house built on oil fields or gold. Maybe that would do it. But it's it would be something un- ridiculously unprecedented that would shoot the market up that quickly. Um, it just doesn't because there's a lot of people that sell when stocks start going up. Right? There's just this. Na- there's no uh, uh, you know that the accumulation of greed over time. That emotional reaction doesn't happen overnight where fear can happen in an instant. Um, As capitalists, we're always a little greedy, right? But to get me to quadruple my amount of greed in a single day would take quite a bit and it wouldn't happen. It would would accumulate over time. But to get me fearful uh, because of, uh, you know, events that you and I have lived through, Derek, through our trading lives, like 9-11 or the flash crash in 2010, for those types of things, fear is instant in those scenarios. And the instant reaction and usually wrong reaction is sell it all. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, the options market is, we'll, we'll kind of transition to probabilities, Jay. And when the options market is is sort of setting prices and we talked about implied volatility and we talked about how implied volatility by its prices sort of implies um, what the probability is that a stock or a market will trade between, and I'm holding up my hands between here and here. And the larger the the implied volatility, the greater that range is. And so, you know, I know a lot of um, 
the strategy with selling volatility or selling credit spreads in the market and the high probability, you know, you named it high probability option strategy is using probabilities. And of course, we remember the the whole bell curve, right? You know, 68% of the time results will be within the bell curve. And then the, within two standard deviations is 95% of the time results will be between, you know, here and here, right? And then you start to get into uh, higher and higher, you know, standard deviations. But can you talk about how you're using, you know, well, just in general, like probability-based trading and probabilities with with something going in the money and then maybe how you use it to position trades? Yeah, so, uh, the okay, so this whole concept of implied volatility means the options market is giving you information about what's going to happen over the next 30 days, right? We've established that. It's based on what people are willing to pay for the options. Well, because there is a predictive nature associated with, uh, with options, you can now use that information, you meaning any investor really that has access to this, which is free out there in the, in the world, uh, to use that information to get a, a, uh, an assessment of where the market will be on any given day. So uh, without getting too uh, statistically uh, deep here and, uh, and, and really geeking out, I will tell you that options can give you an idea of where the market will be with, with, a, with a certainty defined by probability. So what do I mean by that? Well, right now, uh, let's say the market, the VIX is at 20. Um, when you look out, the market, it will, the options market will tell you that, you know, within a 95% range on any given day, we could tell you where the market is going to be. Think about it as like a big kind of uh, cone extending out on the chart. Um, and the higher the probability you want to know where the market will be, the wider the cone. So for example, if you wanted to figure out, you know, what's, uh, you know, give me a 50, 50 shot of where the market's going to be in the next week. Um, there's a certain number of prices and dates that you could, you could plot. But then if you said, well, tell me, you know, within a 95% certainty where the market is going to be, well, that is going to encompass even a much larger, uh, set of prices and dates. And so um, we use that probability to create exposure in areas that have uh, statistically high probabilities of success to our favor. I'll give you a great example. Maybe this is a better way to think about it. In this high probability strategy, we put on positions that have a high probability of being successful because the positions themselves have a low probability of failure. So I just kind of flipped it there, right? So high prob of success means low prob of failure. Well, what we do is we put on positions that, let me just give you an example here. Uh, let's say we have one week to go in the market, right? A position that profits from the market not dropping more than 10% in a week, right? It's rare. We already established that. It's rare that the market will drop 10% in a single week. So if somebody will give me money to put on that position, I'll take that because the chance of it happening is low. And historically speaking, our models have been fairly accurate at lining up the probability of success against actual success. Um, I, I, this is a, a data point that I don't think many uh, uh, managers will be able to say, but the high probability option strategy has over a 92% success rate. That means 92 out of 100 trades we put on end up being successful. I don't know a lot of strategies on Wall Street that do that, uh, but this one is designed to do that. And uh, we feel that the term high probability is an appropriate description. Now, the other side of that coin is risk and return, right? What's the risk we take for the return we get on that strategy? And I won't go into too much on that because we're talking tomorrow about volatility, but that is also a data point that we look at. We always want to make sure our return exceeds our risk in that strategy. So A, we have a high probability of success, historically speaking, about a 92 plus percent success rate. Uh, and B, whenever we do take risk in those positions, we make sure we are getting paid in excess of the risk we're taking. So all of that lines up, hopefully that's kind of a high level there, uh, a description for you, Derek, but using this implied volatility concept of where the option market is saying the stock market may go, we use that to put on positions that have a high probability of success. Yeah, Janet, I, I love the description. And, and I think it's important noting, too, that 
knowing what to do with the current environment is also important. In other words, when volatility or implied volatility is around 10 or 9 or something like that, uh, the market is telling you there is a very low probability that a market will move X percent. But X percent might be a little bit too close. And so I think, you know, the calculus behind figuring out, you know, where to where is the optimal spot to, to place a sell order on volatility is really important because sometimes the market's giving you signals, but over the long term, you might say, well, look, that's that's too close, even though the market is is saying the probability is very low. And so I think that's one of the reasons, and, and maybe we'll touch on this in a little bit when we talk about some of the ETFs that have been out there. But I think it was really easy for people to sell volatility for a lot of years. And this is why it's important to understand that even though you see a probability that looks really high, there's a lot of other things to consider. Yeah. And actually, uh, just because there's an implied move in the options market doesn't mean it's right. Right. Uh, uh, you know, anything can happen. And there are times where we just simply disagree with the options market. Right. I just finished telling you how it's so wonderful that we can do this implied volatility calculation and project a probability of blah, blah, blah. But let me tell you, sometimes it's just wrong. And so we do have another set of guidelines uh, or bumpers, have you will, that uh, prevent us from taking on too much risk. Uh, let, let's think about this. I live in Florida we, and, and my humidity is much higher than yours in Arizona. We've already established that, right? And, you know, if you go all hurricane season without a hurricane, it doesn't mean you blow off November and December that there's no chance of a hurricane, right? Uh, those, are, those are some of the things that just because of the nature of where I live or where we live in the stock market, there's always a chance. There's always a chance that a weather pattern could cause something improbable to occur. And so, you know, uh, you know, we don't stop running our, you know, generator service in, uh, you know, December, January, February, just because we made it through hurricane season without a hurricane. There's still guidelines you need to use to operate to make sure that you are successful. And believe it or not, the easiest trap to fall into is when volatility is very low, thinking it will continue to be low. Uh, you know, there are plenty of times, Derek, you know this, where we just, we don't invest. We don't trade because it's the options market just as wrong, or it's not giving the right premium that we feel comfortable with for the risk that we're taking. And so, you know what? We wait. The great thing about volatility, even in a year like 2017, that's never been, uh, never had such low volatility, even in those years, volatility always rears its head. And so waiting for volatility isn't that hard of a thing to explain to people. And it's even easier to explain when you say, hey, we've got a set of rules that have kept us profitable over time. It's very easy for people to understand why patience can be a virtue. Yeah, and I think it's also important to point out, I mean, we say low probability, you say, oh, you know, there's only a 1% probability of loss or 2% probability of loss. If you reframe that and said, well, if you step outside of your house today, you have a 2% chance of having a safe land on you, uh, maybe you don't go outside today. So it's low, vol low probability of loss doesn't mean no probability of loss. And I think that gets into sort of the way that this gets sized in, in the right client's portfolio. Uh, we always say, you know, no more than 10 or, or 20%. It's a, it's a satellite strategy, not a core strategy, uh, but it, because it has leverage, it allows the potential, the potential to get uh, returns in, in different types of markets. And, you know, I think that's, when we think about the benefits of adding a volatility strategy, I always think about this too, not only for the income side, but also, you know, income, especially with bonds as low as they've been, and bonds are so levered to interest rates right now, meaning if interest rates go up, bond market values could come under pressure. But also the idea, you know, we're in 2018 now, we're getting close to flat in the S&P 500. But having a satellite strategy like this can also potentially produce returns in, in flat markets and markets that are up, but also markets that, are, as long as they're not down too much, too too far, too fast, right? So, 
talk about just some of the benefits that maybe I've already covered them, Jay, but just, uh, yeah, well, listen, you, you, you hit on the big one, the benefit of a strategy, uh, like this, and let's call it an alternative strategy, right? Volatility trading is not one of your core asset classes like stocks or bonds. So the benefit of any alternative strategy like this is its returns should be uh, separated in some fashion from the returns of the rest of your portfolio. And we've all heard uh, the general guidance about diversification provide being protection that's not always the case, right? We don't, Derek and I certainly don't uh, think that that is uh, uh, the golden rule. But what we do believe in is establishing portfolios where you have multiple chances to win. And uh, the high probability option strategy, because its returns are not linked to the returns of the S&P 500 or the bond market, well, it is designed to give you a different return profile based off whatever's going on in the market. And when you get a year like 2018, which is more volatile than 2017, uh, things like alternatives start to really show their value. And uh, and so we like to say that hypos, the high probability option strategy, is designed to give you just a completely different exposure uh, to growth than anything else in your portfolio. Um, quick reference. Uh, without giving actual numbers here, you know, stocks were better than hypos in 2017, but in 2018, hypos will probably be better than the re- than than stocks and bonds in 2018. And so it's just again one of those things that uh, we are uh, running a strategy that, while it may seem tactical because of the frequency of the investing, which is about monthly, um, is designed to generate income and returns that. Uh, aren't derived from bonds or stocks. I mean, that's the biggest benefits when I think about why anybody would want hypos in their portfolio. Uh, you know, we could get into the why it works at some other day, and we've already touched on that. But the why you want it is all about generating returns that just aren't linked to anything else in your portfolio. It's like having multiple lines in the water when you're fishing. You've just got a lot of different ways to catch something. You know, Jay, we touched on it a little bit how selling volatility was really easy for several years. And whenever something is easy, it seems like it's, well, too easy. And you see people who maybe were never in the markets before all of a sudden, you know, running a a short volatility strategy. And so I thought it'd be interesting to just touch on, you know, not, not go too in depth about, uh, they called it what the vol apocalypse. Wow. I could, I, I was rehearsing how to say that actually, but and that's when you did pretty yeah, good. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> but essentially, there was some some funds. Uh, I think you know some ETFs that were selling volatility um, because of a spike, an extreme spike in volatility. And then the way that those work, where they actually have so that essentially what they're doing is they're selling really just at the money futures. In other words, if let's say the VIX cash is you know. 10 and, and the VIX future is 12, you're selling near month or near, uh, you know, out a couple of weeks, VIX futures. And if the VIX spikes, uh, let's say if you're selling them at 12 and the VIX goes to 24, well, the the whole, the account goes to zero if, is, if you're going all in and you're buying, you know, you're selling those. And so there were a lot of people who were looking at these these funds and these ETFs that had really, really good performance because selling volatility and let it go to expiration as it sort of decayed was a winning trade for for some time. And then all of a sudden it wasn't. And so I, th- I think it's worth noting, and, and I don't know, Jay, if you have any comments on on what happened there, and but just the difference between sell, you know, that type of short volatility where you're selling near near the money or out the money futures versus selling deep out of the money credit spreads on an index. Okay. So yes, absolutely. I have an opinion about that. Um, and we did see in February, uh, a rare event in the volatility market that caused not only a lot of novice investors, but some pretty experienced firms to decide they didn't know what they were doing. Um, and without naming any names, there were some firms that have been in the option business for 30 years that are no longer in business at all because of that volnado. Did you call it a volnado? Oh no, Should I we call I, it a, I was a volcopolis. 
Apocalypse, <laughs> Volnado. Well, Apocalypse. Is that like Sharknado? Well, I did not practice it clearly. I was going Sharknado right. on you. Yeah, yeah, Sharknado in volatility. Sharks flying. That's about what it felt like for those guys, I would imagine. And so the, the difference is those uh, strategies were directional based. Those were directional based strategies on, you know, straight up plays on the VIX futures, which we've already established are like a third derivative of the stock market, right? You got VIX, which is a derivative of the options, which is a derivative of the S&P, which is a derivative of stocks. So, you know, you've got this, this, this complicated vehicle um, that they are taking directional bets on and uh, they were not getting paid enough for the risk that they took because volatility seemed to be non-existent in the year 2017. We've already talked about that. And so when you find yourself on the wrong side of a short strategy, I think we've all heard this before, right? Uh, when you're short stock, your losses, your potential losses are infinite because anything can go up as high as it wants to go. When you're long anything, right? When you own it, all you can do is what you paid, lose is what you paid for, right? It goes down to zero and that's it. Well, um, you know, think about this. They were selling uh, vehicles at, you know, at a 10 and hoping that they went to zero, but their exposure was, you know, 10 to infinity. Now, obviously the VIX will never go to infinity, but Derek and I have lived through times where the VIX went over 90. Um, Derek and I have lived through times where the VIX has gone to 50 more recently. Heck, I think the VIX went to 50 in February of 2018. And so if you're in a position that, you know, you could lose $10 uh, being long if it goes to zero, uh, or you could lose $40 if the VIX goes, you know, from 10 to 50. And the, by the way, those are crude representations of what actually happened, but it's just an example. Um, their upside risk was just way too, too dramatic. And when you're looking at something like the VIX, which again, is a calculation, it's a, it's a math equation. There's actually nobody owning or holding, a, you know, a piece of paper that says, I'm, I own the VIX. So when you look at that, and that calculation is derived off of this options market, quick moving markets will cause the VIX to move very, very dramatically. And on that day in February, that these uh, uh, short volatility ETFs and funds uh, experienced, the VIX doubled in a single day. Has never happened before, but mathematically, of course, you could double in a single day. It's just math, right? That's, uh, it takes a lot to do it. Actually, in this case, it didn't take too much to do it. I think the market moved only 3 or 4% that day, Derek, and it caused the VIX to double in a single day, which if you were short the VIX, it means you lost 100% of your money. And so that was kind of the dynamic. That is nothing like what we do in hypos. Nothing, nothing, nothing like hypos because we are not directionally based, right? We told you we take positions that uh, have a high probability of success, which means a very improbable event would cause us to lose. And while the VIX doubling in a single day was an improbable event, um, we were insuring so far away uh, out of the market that even that doubling in the VIX uh, did not cause the problems in the strategy that it did for those funds and ETFs that were more directional based. Right? When you're directionally based, the, as the math says, you're 50 50 win or loss. Now, over time, with selling things like volatility that have a little extra premium in there, you might be profitable in short term periods. But over the long term, being directionally long or short the VIX is a very difficult game to be successful in. And I don't know anybody that has done it successfully as a core strategy over any period of time longer than a year. And so typically, people will find themselves on the wrong side of that trade because it's directionally based. Um, we all know stocks are designed to go up over time, and I won't get into that too much, but markets are designed to go up. And that's why most people just buy stocks. The concept of buy and hold is evident. We like to hedge it, buy and hedge, plug for my book. But if you're short volatility, you can get hurt because your losses can definitely exceed the gains you've had and all the time leading up to it. So Again, hopefully I didn't make it too complicated, Derek, but directionally based volatility strategies uh, like certain ETFs and, and institutions and hedge funds are one thing. Our high probability option strategy that benefits from the improbable not occurring is a completely different thing. Well, and I think the point you make is an important one, and it's one we've been talking about with bonds. You know, with bonds rates so low, 
any move in interest rates can cause material losses in, in bond market values and any material move in interest rates, right? And it was the same thing with how low the, uh, the volatility complex was, the VIX futures, because those were so low, it became really even more levered. Um, and, you know, if you're short those, a, a 10 to 20 move, and I don't think the VIX future was ever 10, but let's say, you know, a 13 to 26 move is a 100% move in the value of those. So I think it's it's a good point. You know, and the other thing is... Uh, well, I, let me just add yeah. one thing on there. Be, and it's because the volatility was so low in 2017, in order for them to generate their expected returns, they had to take more and more risk to get there, right? So something that used to make them a dollar in 2015 or 14 now only makes them 25 cents in 2017. So you got to do it four more times than you did in previous years. And what happened is that low volatility environment caused a lot of chasing of premium uh, from those sellers of premium. And that is the thing. They ended up, they found themselves completely leveraged and then the most unlikely event that they've ever thought would happen occurred right in the face of all of it. Yeah. And the reason why the VIX index itself does not trade, really, if, if the VIX itself traded like a stock with no expiration date, well, anytime the VIX went up, you could just sell it or short it and just wait for it to come back because at some point it will. But when you're selling VIX futures, they all have an expiration date and yeah, you got, the, you got that time component to worry about. It's not just direction, it's time. You got to get them both right. So Jay, uh, kind of in the remaining moments, um, we, we almost have to do a, a Volpocalypse, Volnado part two episode, I think, Jay, at some point. But um, real quick, I mean, I, I think one of the, the benefits of Hypos, the high probability option strategy that we do, is around just how picky um you know, we are and you are in, in, in managing the portfolio of when you enter a trade. And, and it, it kind of ties into what we were just talking about. Uh, a lot of those funds, they always had to be short volatility. They couldn't be just lying in wait, just waiting for a more optimal point. And so I think that's an, an important thing to talk about, just, you know, real quickly, how waiting on the sidelines and waiting for the right moment helps to improve the probabilities a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. I touched on it earlier, um, but I will repeat it. We do have a set of rules that we use that help us determine if the options market is mispricing risk or inappropriately pricing risk, I should say. And um, those guidelines and bumpers uh, prevent us from doing a misstep or getting uh, caught in a trap of a of reaching for too much return in a period where we take too much risk. And even if the options market tells you, hey, that's okay right now, we know the options market isn't uh, 100% accurate. Actually, um, it, it is more accurate than historical returns, but the implied returns of the options market, they really are only right 80% of the time. So if we know that 20% of the time, the data we're getting out of the options market is going to cause us to have a misstep, well, we needed a separate set of rules on top of that, our own probability calculations that uh, tell us when it's okay to step into the water. Now, I told you we're not 100%. We're 92% successful. That's still pretty good. But there are times even when we do our own calculations over the top, we still find ourselves in a trade that lost money. However, because of our discipline, and I'm going to use that word a lot when it comes to this strategy, discipline about not taking risk uh, that doesn't reward you properly. That discipline at times will make us very picky, as you use that word, Derek. We will pick and choose where and when we take our risk. And there are times where the, uh, the market uh, is appropriately evaluating risk and will appropriately compensate us for the risk that we're taking. In other words, we get paid properly. Or there's times where the market is not properly compensating us for the risk we're going to take, and we don't act. And uh, historically speaking, uh, on average, out of the 365 days a year, we are in cash 100 days of the year, right? So that includes weekends. So let's say it's about a quarter of the time, a third to a quarter of the time, we're actually not invested. And what does that mean? That means that if you do get some sort of an event while you're in cash, well, we're in cash, we don't take a lot of risk. But it means there are going to be times of, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks. I think one time we were in cash for five weeks 
uh, waiting to get into a position. When that occurs, you know, you have to, we trust that our historical models, the things that have given us a 92% success rate will keep us out of harm's way. Sometimes it was right to be in cash. Sometimes we should have taken the risk. However, we always defer to being conservative because we know the risk is so great. And if 2018, February of 2018 specifically showed us anything is that not properly assessing your risk versus the return you're, you're getting uh, can get you into a lot of hot water. Well, Jay, well said. And I know uh, we could sort of go on forever on this topic. I feel like one of us should trademark Valnado or Valpocalypse. That, I feel a t-shirt coming on, Jay. Yeah, we would just do a big tornado and uh, have a bunch of stock symbols <laughs> flying around in a circle. <laughs> no. Well, look, yeah, this, this has been great. I appreciate you coming on. And it's, uh, it's a fascinating discussion. I mean, you and I love talking about volatility and options, and we, we may very well have to, to do another episode. But hopefully this gives everyone a good idea. You know, these terms get thrown out all the time, and sometimes people just don't stop and explain it. And so Really, I think covering those things and then also talking about the benefits of a, uh, a short volatility or a volatility strategy. I feel like you know, the new portfolios going forward, as you said, going to be a lot of hedged equity, going to be a lot of volatility. It's uh, not going to look the same. So, Jay, thanks again for coming on. Derek, it was my pleasure. Always enjoy it. Uh, good luck. Episode 13, All maybe. Right. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you next week. 